I just checked and uh, actually uh, I think uh, it doesn't take so much time as I thought. So I am not so pressed in time now as I was in the beginning of the last hour. So if you want to uh, intervene, it's quite okay. And I also want to say something more about Hayek's critique, because that is a very similar critique that came back against Keynesianism later also. And in this funny rapping film, uh, Keynes, he ha have drinks all the time. He drinks very much. And he gets a hangover the next morning. And then Hayek, you see, you drink too much. It's a hangover. And he, so Hayek compares to take drinks with expansionary fiscal policies. The politicians pour out a lot of money and then the people get lazy. The trade unions say we get higher wages, we don't have to work so hard and if unemployment is not so big, no long uh, seekers of work outside the factory, then the trade unions can say, you must give us more wages because they don't feel threatened by unemployment. So Hayek's argument is very much, you need a certain amount of unemployment to keep down inflation. And if you get inflation, it's more expensive for foreigners to buy goods from this country where this Keynesian policy was adopted and therefore uh, it's dangerous to have this expansionary. Com compare with Greece today. The European Union says to Syriza, the Greek left government, that you must tighten the fiscal policy. You don't have, you can't spend so much because otherwise you can't uphold uh, the competitive power of Greek industry. Very similar type of argument that was heard from von Hayek in 1930, in the beginning of the 1930s. Well, anyway, a growing number of politicians were positive to Keynes, but they did not listen to his plea for free trade, because for Keynes it was very important to combine free trade with active stabilization policy of the state. The US was among the worst offenders by opposing the highest tariffs in its history in 1930. Hitler also used protectionist trade policy strategically. So the US politicians said that after the Wall Street collapse, it was a big crisis, we must stop to buy things from the foreigners. So you must buy American instead to save American industry. And then they, those lots of tariffs in 1930. And also they tried to balance the budget and since the um, uh, on a mass unemployment, the workers didn't pay so much taxes and so the tax base went down and then they had to cut public spending to balance the budget. So the state then contributed to the depression, the downturn of the economy. Uh, Hitler also used protectionist trade policies uh, strategically. Also, a sort of protectionist policy, sie müssen Deutsch kaufen. And in Sweden they said, Schöp svenskt. Everywhere, this sort of, we must save ourselves not to buy things from the foreigners. And also in India and Latin America, this kind of thinking was very strong. And the result was that if you take global export, which is of course equals global import, as a percentage of global 
gross domestic product. You have heard, I suppose, most of you, the concept gross domestic product. Or, yeah, uh, it's a sort of measurement of uh, total national production or total national income. It's practically the same. So you see, uh, up till uh, the Wall Street crash, it, it increased. But then it was a downturn un until the end of the, first, of the Second World War. And then it goes up again. Very much. So, when representatives from the winning nations met in Bretton Woods, a small village in New Hampshire, United States, in 1944, they were united on that a new economic world order must see to it that no after-war crisis and no trade wars would occur again. In Roosevelt's opening speech in Bretton Woods, he said, the economic health of every country is a proper matter of concern to all its neighbors, near and far. And Keynes was there. He was an old man. He died in 46, so he was not very healthy. He suggested a banker, a neutral global currency, exchangeable with national currency. So he didn't want to take away the national currencies, but he wanted also uh, an international, a global currency. Uh, and he also wanted to have a so-called international clearing union, where every country would have an overdraft facility equivalent to half the average value of its trade over the past five years. So, uh, in order to avoid countries with big surpluses and other countries with big deficits in their trade, he said that if they have, uh, if they have surpluses, they must, they must pay this to this clearing fund and get very low interest rate on this money. And if they have deficits, they could go to this clearing union and borrow money from. Uh, and all interest paid should be placed in the Clearing Union's Reserve Fund. You got later in the International Monetary Fund something called Special Drawing Rights. That was a little similar to Keynes' idea, but Keynes' idea was much more so, so strong role for this Clearing Union. But, and he also wanted to have a strong international trade organization. Uh, because he was, as I said, a free trader. And he wanted to have an international organization for this. But, Keynes' proposals had no chance in Bretton Woods. Support for it in the United Kingdom was lukewarm and the US was against. You must remember that now, 1944-45, US economy was half of the world's. Half of world GDP was produced in the United States. It was an extremely strong economy. Now it's down to perhaps 50 and China is growing up and probably passing the United States. So it was a very different situation, extremely economic power. And in the US taste, it was, not, it was too neutral and pluralistic. We want to govern the world, so help us God, so to say. Uh, so the US politicians wanted to have a leading role with dollar as the new gold standard. And they also rejected the International Trade Organization and preferred weaker temporary agreements that they could control themselves. And the result in Bretton Woods, it was not something, I mean, 
decided exactly how it should be, but you could say that the ideas of Bretton Woods dominated by the U.S. representatives was gradually formed during the 40s and 50s, and the result was this. Dollar standard, one owns, one owns gold equal to $35. So in principle, every person who had a dollar could go to, according to the legend, it was Fort Knox in the United States, and say, I want to have one 35th part of one ounce gold for this dollar. Uh, actually, most of the gold is in New York, uh, but the legend was that it was Fort Knox. Uh, and pegged but adjustable currencies fixed to the dollars. For instance, in Sweden, uh, after a while, when I was young, one dollar was 55 crowns and 18 euro. And that was something, I mean, it was self-evident. I mean, a dollar was a dollar, it's five crowns. You couldn't think of anything else. And that was so for a very long time. And adjustable, you can change the, the dollar course a little now and then, but in principle, a dollar course of your currency should be, it should be pegged to the dollar. And free trade as a principle, but it was general agreements of tariffs and trade rounds starting in 1947, and we had several such negotiation rounds. And you could say that Keynes had one sort of influence, that Keynesian policy, uh, national policy, and currency and credit control for full employment was accepted as a general principle for national economic policies and a fund for solving balance of payment problems, a weak form of this currency union that Keynes wanted to have, later to become the International Monetary Fund, was also instituted. And long-term loans to developing countries via the World Bank. Well, now we go over to communism. It took over in, as you know, in Eastern Europe. Here is a picture. I have used it in a, I have written a book about the Swedish left socialist. And he's, in his newspaper he, he made this picture. There is Stalin. Oh, yeah. oh. There is Stalin, and he sits on Finland, and the Finnish comrade says, Hurrah, comrades, we are at last, we are free, he says. Uh, so it's a very evil picture of Stalin. Uh, and here is, who is that? Churchill. Churchill. In March 46, he held his famous Iron Wall speech and the Cold War followed. And now you could say that Keynes' ideas from the First World War, now they were implemented. The Marshall Plan, General Marshall in the United States, he had a big speech, also him, and it was implemented in 1948, and when it ended in 1951, around 2% of US GDP annually had been invested in Europe. And later the program shifted to Japan. Lots of US dollars poured out as loans and subsidies. And also, of course, lots of foreign investments, big American firms invested in Europe and Japan and also in the rest of the world. And here is, it's difficult to see, a Marshall Plan expenditure by country. Uh, 
Yeah, the staple. You can perhaps see uh, blue staples in different countries. You can see that in Britain and France and also Western Germany and Benelux and also a little in, this, in the Nordic countries, the martial money poured in. And it worked just as Keynes wanted it, you could say. This was gave a sort of expansionary impulse to the economies of getting this martial aid. And with U.S. support, the European Coal and Steel Community Treaty came in 1951, and in Rome 1959, the treaty establishing the European Economic Community was signed by six countries, West Germany, France, Italy, and Benelux, the three, Holland, uh, Belgium, and Luxembourg, forming a customs union. And remember, it was a customs union, not a free trade area, a customs union first of all. Common customs against the rest of the world. And who is that? Mao. Mao. The Soviet Empire and the revolution in China 1949 scared capitalists and politicians in the West and fostered, you could say, cooperation between capitalists labor movements and states, as well as active policies against unemployment in the West. The economic cooperative wonders in Western Germany and Japan, and also the Scandinavian welfare systems, were attributed as models for other nations. This is a little of a paradox. The losing nations, Japan and Germany, were the big sort of winners in the period 50s and 60s. The economies grew. And this was partly because of, it was an interest in the United States to see to it that communism couldn't have a chance in, in Japan or in Western Germany, because you had Eastern Germany. And in Eastern Germany, they had to pay a lot of money to us, as in sort of corresponding to a Versailles Treaty. The East Germans had to pay back a lot to Soviet Russia. And Lots of machines were taken from Eastern Germany and invested in, in Soviet Russia. So, so it was another way around. So then the West could show up West Germany as a model for the poor Easterners, see how successful capitalism is here. And Joseph Schumpeter, Schumpeter who was a very famous economist. He was also a, a minister in Austria in the beginning of the 40s. He wrote a very famous book uh, and he believed in 1944 in the inevitable future victory of socialism. The book was about the creative destruction. Capitalism was described as you, all the time you destruct the old sort of industries. But this is creative process. But also it is a sort of bureaucratization in the big capitalist firms, and then it will inevitably lead to some sort of socialism by which he meant a sort of planned economy. That was his ideas. And the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, here is him. He proclaimed a peaceful competition between East and West. And Paul Samuelson, a very famous Economy Prize winner, uh, in 1970, in the worldwide spread textbook economics, he predicted that the United, the Soviet Union would overtake the United States in GDP per capita in the 1990s. You could see that's very wonderful that an economist, world famous, with this very sophisticated mathematical models. He believed that Soviet Union would pass the United States. So a warning for all sort of prognosis of this sort. Now today people say China will now be biggest in the world in 2035. I say perhaps, but you shall never be sure. In those days, nobody could believe that the Soviet Union would collapse. So, don't be too sure. 
Here is Paul Severson, yeah. Also in the Third World or the South, countries that were unaligned with either the Soviet bloc on, in the East or the capitalist bloc in the West, there was a belief, a sort of neo-mercantilism, if I use Jan R. Scholte's definition. I had a very big discussion with Edmir Dominguez about the concept, the, I had school of dependence but we have different opinions on the concept school of dependence, what that really was. So I, I will use this neo-mercantilist sort of concept. And here is, nobody knows, somebody here from Latin America, South America. He was very famous then, Raul Prebisch. He was a Central Bank of Argentina boss. He said that the United States and the West profit more from trade than the South. He pointed to the decline in the terms of trade for the southern countries in Asia, Latin America and Africa, who had to export more to get the same value of industrial exports. He recommended a breakout from the world market and a nationalist policy of state-owned companies, exchange control and import substitution, that is, to invest in companies producing things that was formerly imported. And political leaders in the South, like Jahavaralero in India, Juan Perón in Argentina, and Julius Nyerere in Tanzania, here they are, as well as a number of national liberation movements in the South were influenced by this sort of idea. Break out of the logic of the world, capitalist world market, and build up a sort of socialist or non-capitalist the concept in Soviet Russia was non-capitalist, a sort of state-planned system trying to build up walls against this capitalist world market. Cheap oil, mass production of cars, television sets and other industrial products based on new technology led to stability and economic growth in the West. In the 1960s, there was a widespread belief among leading politicians and economists in the West that they had found method for the national states to, by means of fiscal and monetary policy, policy stabilize capitalism. Even the conservative US President Richard Nixon was quoted as saying, I am now a Keynesian in economics. So this was not a sort of left-wing or social democratic idea. This was hailed all over the political spectrum. But Marx's teacher in philosophy, Friedrich Hegel, talked about the cunning of history. When humanity is sure that it has solved their problems, history strikes. That is my uh, sort of idea. <laughs> Nixon's statement came just after he had announced that the dollar price in gold no longer could be upheld. And that was the decision that can be seen as the beginning of the death process of Keynesianism. Here is Hegel. Well, on the 15th of August 1971, you were not born then. I remember it still. Uh, a rather pale Richard Nixon on television announced the temporary suspension of the dollar's convertibility into gold. And why? Well, European states had earlier wanted US dollars in their currency reserves, and there was a strong belief that the gold reserve in Fort Knox was big enough to back up this high dollar value. So there was, there was a strong temptation for the US government to finance its war in Vietnam and other foreign expenses by loans and investments from abroad. The US could use its power to evade the discipline that an international monetary order must impose on surplus and deficit nations alike in order to achieve a stable equilibrium. Uh, what do I mean by this? In normally 
those big deficits, lots of dollars went out from the United States, should weaken the dollar if you use normal sort of economic theory. But the belief in the United States and the dollars, politically and militarily, was so strong that people, even if uh, the interest rate in the United States was, was lower and uh, uh, the uh, people in the United States lived over their own, they had a living standard much higher than their own production. The belief in the system was so big that people from China, Japan, or even China, at least later, and Europe, they took their money and put it into banks on Wall Street because they believed that there, in the dollars, they are really, I can be sure. And, but of course, in the long run, it's impossible to pour out so much money. Then people begin to look at the dollar. Can they really pay me for gold on this? And also in France, this is the Vietnam War. Yeah. Uh, when the Vietnam War went bad for the US government and leftist liberation movements were successful also in other parts of the world, confidence in the dollar started to slide. States began to seek as the gold standard allowed them to the conversion of their dollars into gold. President de Gaulle in France, already in 1965, announced his intention to exchange U.S. dollar reserves for gold at the official exchange rate. He sent the French Navy across the Atlantic to pick up the French reserve of gold and was followed by several countries. La gloire, said de Gaulle. I want, don't want to have my money in U.S. banks. Uh, so he started a process, sort of, followed by several other. Here is the goal. And Nixon's declaration was accompanied in 1971, was accompanied by bellicose demands that other countries should revalue their currencies so as to eliminate unfair exchange rates, as Nixon said. The US was, in other words, seeking to pass on the cost of adjustment to other states. The decision to leave the fixed gold price in dollars was in reality final. It signified the end of the Bretton Woods system. Exactly what Keynes had warned for in 1994 happened in 1971. This is supposed to be an oil tower. And who is this man? Oh, no. Sheikh Yamani. He was the oil minister of Saudi Arabia. Uh, after the war between Israel and Egypt in 1973, OPEC, that was the oil producing uh, sort of cartel of the countries, met in Kuwait with Sheikh Yamani from Saudi Arabia's chairman and decided to re reduce oil production with an average 5%. The oil price went up uh, from 2 to around 10%, around $50 today. It's down there again. It was up over 100 a while ago, which was a restoration of the real price level from 45. You could say that the Western growth model in the 50s and 60s was based on cheap oil. The oil price compared to other prices went down and down. So mass car production and the whole sort of uh, transport systems in the West. They could grow on cheap oil, oils, both from countries like Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. And when, uh, for instance, the people in Ir Iran choose a leader, Mossadegh, in 1953 to take over the oil production, uh, nationalize oil production, CIA went in and managed to kick him out and uh, in store the Shah of Iran instead to secure cheap oil import to the West. It's a very simplified history I give you and you can read for yourself about this so you don't. Of course I'm trying to indoctrinate you but 
just so that you are aware of that. Okay. Uh, Of course, this meant problems for production costs, employment, and balance on payments in oil importing countries. Few governments dared to bridge over the crisis by expansionary policies. 1975 was a year of depression for world capitalism. The defeat for the US in Vietnam in 1975 and the victory for a number of Soviet backed liberation movements in Africa seemed to tilt the world order in favor of the second and third worlds. At least we who belong to the Vietnam movement and the new left, we believe now we will see the big victory for socialism all over the world. But that was very wrong. Uh, 1975 was rather to be a turning point in the opposite direction. Here is Milton Friedman again. The growing financial world market and the volatile exchange rates led to a radical change in economics. Milton Friedman from Chicago, winner of the Economic Prize 1976, became the new leader of international political economy. His message was in short. Most important for governments is to bring down inflation. In the long run, it is impossible to have unemployment lower than a natural rate of unemployment. And that is a rate which can be combined with a non-accelerating inflation. Don't manage demand by short-time fiscal policies, said Milton Friedman. Let independent central banks take over monetary policy with the only task to fight the inflation. Lower taxes and privatize. In Sweden, 1974-75, with the Social Democratic government, and in France, 1981, President Mitterrand. Here is Olof Palme up there, and there is, there is um, Olof Palme was a prime minister in Sweden in the 70s until 76, and there is Mitterrand in France. Uh, they tried to fight unemployment with expansionary fiscal policies in the sort of Keynesian tradition. But they were punished with inflation and capital flight because now capital money was so mobile that Swedish and French capitalists, they just took their money and put it into safer havens in other countries where inflation was lower. So. Um, they have to, both of them had to sort of back down. And, or in Sweden, rather, we had to devalue the, the Swedish krona several times. And the bourgeois government took over in 76. And in France, the left wing alliance government also had very, very big problems. And their opinion polls, they went down very fast. So Keynes' vision of full employment and stability faded. Yeah, you can see it there. Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan. The 80s was a period of victory for this new school of political economics. Political leaders like Margaret Thatcher from 1971 in Britain and Ronald Reagan from 80 in the United States were elected through programs in this direction. Capitalism blossomed, but in an unemployment and inequality grew. Not only in Europe and the United States, the new ideas were spread in the 1980s. In states where politicians opened up their countries to the world markets and adapted their policies, to suit mobile capital experienced a fast economic growth. Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea and Taiwan were called the four Asian tigers. All over the world, law hindering, laws hindering short-term capital flows or the right for foreign capital to invest and take home their profits were abolished. And who is this? 
Khomeini. Yeah. Oil prices doubled again after the revolution in Iran in January 1979. Also, interest rates increased. Many countries, in especially Latin America, where prebish import substitution type of policies had been followed, had taken big loans in dollars to finance public investment programs. Falling exchange rates meant that the loans became more expensive. When oil prices fell again in, in the beginning of the 80s, Mex also Mexico was a big oil producer was hit. In August 82, its government declared that it couldn't meet its payment dates and announced a moratorium of 90 days and requested a renegotiation of payment periods and new loans. Billions of dollars of loans were now due immediately. The banks accepted new loans only if the debtor countries accepted the intervention of the International Monetary Fund, who demanded so-called structural adjustment programs, meaning opening up the country for foreign investment and import, cuts in public spending such as price support for basic food stuff, stuff and privatization of state property. Again, you can compare with the demands on Greece today. And here is a staple that's difficult for you to see. But uh, those staples is uh, growth of external debt in relation to GDP in 82, 92 and 2002. And uh, extreme high figures in, for instance, Argentina, Brazil, uh, and so on, and Mexico and so on. Uh, this was a Latin American debt crisis. And also the Soviet Empire now stagnated. The new information technology could not be used as in the West. Manuel Castells, you have him in the course literature, wrote about the failed restructuring of statism to adapt itself to informationalism. There was a lack of incentives to develop new products in the rigid, centrally planned system. I have also on the course list a uh, little text uh, myself criticizing Castells because I think he's a little too idea idealistic, overvaluing information systems and undervaluing capitalist power. But on the whole, I think his analysis of the reasons why Soviet Union collapsed is very, very good, very precise. Uh, the new centrally planned system were too rigid. They couldn't adapt to new information, internet and so on systems. And the budget in Soviet Union was like a play piece of elastic, as Janos Kolnai, a famous Hungarian economist, economist said. If an enterprise lacked money, the leading party member took the train to Moscow to get more money or lower production targets. There was also a naive belief in that the Marxist theory of value could be used as basis for pricing. This idea contributed, among other things, to too low prices on machinery and natural resources, which in its turn led to immense waste and environmental disaster. Uh, the most advanced technology could be found in the big military apparatus, but they lacked resources and technology to compete with the immense US and NATO complex. So, the Berlin Wall fell down and Soviet Union collapsed. And this was actually the end of my first lecture. And now we have five minutes if you want to ask me something or say something. And it's quite OK to say something very critical. You are very. Silence. Perhaps I shall also at last say something about uh, literature. Um, 
I was here listening to John Arch, fifth lecture. I think it was extremely interesting. I have never met him before. Uh, and I think all those different political ideas that he described, uh, my idea is that I think it's very important if you want to understand a sort of political idea that could be social democracy, it could be Marxism, it could be uh, neoliberalism, or uh, it could be neo-mercantilism or this transformational uh, ideas that he also talked about. I think it's very important to understand them. You must also read the classic texts. For instance, if I take Marx as my favorite example, uh, if you hear different persons talking about what Marx said, uh, people talk as if Marx was the uh, ideologies behind central plan planning, for instance. That's totally wrong. Uh, misconceptions of Marxism and also of neoliberalism. I have the opinion that many people of the left, and especially in Latin America, they overvalue neoliberalism. They see sort of the capitalist development as a result of neoliberal thinking. And I think it's the other way around. Because of the growing financial market and the growing power for capital, neoliberal economic thinking was a very quite natural result. I don't say that it's a sort of mechanical uh, correspondence between us, what Marx cal called productive forces and uh, production systems, and on the one hand, and the and the thinking and laws and so on up here, but I think the basic sort of motor of change is technological development. It's much more important than ideas, political and economists' ideas. So, so. Um, we will, in the end of this course, have a discussion, I know, uh, also with Jan Art about this. But uh, I, I would be very glad if you really try to read those classic texts. Of course, the language is, of course, very much different from what you are used to read on Facebook or whatever you read, or, or Twitter. But uh, I think it's... It belongs to our sort of cultural heritage to understand what they really said and what they really meant. Okay, after this little preach, you have nothing to say. Okay, then we see each other on the 22nd of September again, at 10 o'clock. <laughs>